Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm not sure what time it is where you are. We've got some people that are here with us live for the eighth edition of End of Life Tech for Healthcare, um, and many, many more of you that will be watching this video. So thank you for taking time. Um, we started this series with a very simple intention. We know that clinicians and caregivers are very, very busy, and they don't always have the time to stay up to date on the most amazing solutions around end of life and serious illness care and death care. And we see all of those things as deeply connected, and we want to once a month come together um, and share with you the leaders, the leading solutions, the most remarkable innovations, um, events, things that are primarily happening in the digital sphere um, that are digital solutions, but not always. Um, and I'm here with my co-host and dear friend, Dr. Sylvia Perez Proto, head of the End of Life Center at the Cleveland Clinic and an amazing anesthesiologist and end of life leader. How's it going, Sylvia? Fine, thank you for having me again. I'm very excited to be here. Um, news at the clinic, I can tell you that today I was very excited to know that cases of COVID are decreasing. And also my country is opening the borders for uh, tourism in, in November. So I'm so excited that this is turning to the point to the end. But uh, still, again, remember that uh, vaccinated people get uh, less um, sick and die seven times less than other people that is not vaccinated. So please, please, please get the vaccine or the booster if you are eligible. And then very excited because our end of life course has 480 people uh, enrolled in South America, more than 10 countries in South America and the US. And, uh, you know, spreading these teachings in in places where palliative care is not even uh, available, you know? So I'm very excited to do that and to be, to be part of this big, you know, network of people. And of course, ending with death over dinner in three languages is going to be an amazing closure of the course. So many good things here. How about there, Michael? Well, yeah, and this course is being taught in Spanish, Portuguese, and English, is that correct? Yes, yes, three languages. Yep. So pretty remarkable. It's definitely the first time that we've done a simultaneous um, three different language death dinner um, across so many borders, uh, which is thrilling. So that's going to happen um, at the end of the month. But yeah, we've been incredibly busy at EOL. For those of you, I didn't give a full introduction. Uh, my name is Michael Hebman. I'm the founder of EOL.community and also the founder of a little project called Death Over Dinner. Um, and at EOL, I, I think the thing I've been most excited about um, the last this fall has been our Ask the Doctor series. Um, and we are meeting weekly um, with different doctors to talk about um, end of life care, end of life issues, palliative care, um, and we'll continue that. Um, the some of the folks that we've had recently include Dr. Gabor Matte, um, who's an internationally renowned trauma expert, um, uh, expert on so many things. He actually is a palliative care physician, um, and that's not often talked about. Um, that was his primary work um, before he started working on addiction. Um, and, and so we had an incredible conversation with Gabor. You can see that on um, EOL um, a couple weeks ago. We talked to Ira Bayak a couple days ago. Um, always good to chat with Ira. And next week we have Dr. Anthony Bassas, who's um, one of the leading researchers in psilocybin. Um, which is um, a psychedelic medicine. Um, some people know it as magic mushrooms. Um, treating end-of-life anxiety um, and uh, many other um, maladies we face in the modern era with psychedelic medicine. So we have Anthony Bassas next week. We have Lucy Kalanithi coming up, which is extraordinary um, to get some time with Lucy, who famously finished her husband's um, remarkable book, uh, When Breath Becomes Air. But um, 
Lucy is a st stunning clinician um, and so, so much wisdom. And Adrian Boise, our mutual friend, um, is coming up. Tracy Gade um, and Sunita Puri. And there's, there's going to be more. And then we're going to start the Ask the Nurse series. So, wow, good. yeah, as so many of us know, the real keepers of wisdom around caregiving, especially when it comes to end of life, resides in the nurses. Um, and so we're going to launch that soon. So that's some of the exciting stuff that's going on over at EOL. Um, we have some amazing people today. So um, like always, there's a combination of solutions that are a little bit more clinically focused, healthcare focused, and then some that are just more general human focused. How do we die better? Um, how do we support people in their grief? Um, and so we have Leah, um, the CEO of Vital Decisions with us. Um, Lauren and Aaron from Death Wives are here, um, who are extraordinary. Um, Michael Fratkin, a dear old friend from Resolution Care is here to talk about many things. So um, we've got a packed hour and uh, we're gonna kick it off. Um, and for those who are tuning in, you can fill up the Q&A box anytime you want. Um, it's better to put your questions in the Q&A function down at the bottom of the screen um, than to put it in chat. Sometimes we might miss them in chat. You can chat it up in chat, but if you have a question for our panelists, please put it in Q&A and we'll try to get to all of them. Um, and uh, we're gonna hear from Leah and then Death Wives and then Michael Fratkin, and then we're gonna all have a conversation together. So Leah, tell us about Vital Decisions. Um, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for just creating this platform for, you know, I've learned so much about different um, organizations out there that share similar passion and interests as I do um, through your town hall. So I just so appreciate you guys offering this platform. Um, but yes, Leah Puccio, uh, CEO of Vital Decisions. Um, before I talk about what we do, I wanted to just spend some time talking about like why we exist and how we came about. Um, most of us have had an experience or are familiar with a friend or a loved one who has had a really poor quality of life experience um, during their end of life. And I think one of the things that's so fascinating to me is just how we as a society put so much thought into you know, how our child comes into this world and how we live our lives and what do we do with our time on this earth, but no one really talks about like, how do we want to die or how do you want to go out? Um, and we know it matters. Um, and if you've ever had an experience with someone close to you that, that um, has died, sort of, we know that it matters, but we usually don't realize it until it's too late to do anything about it. Um, so, you know, no surprise, we're all, we're, we're all mortal. We may like to think that we're mortal, but we're not. And as a society, you know, we don't talk about death and, and we don't encourage conversation around it. Um, in fact, many times people will refrain from it. Um, and often when someone is sick, those around them will pull back because they don't know what to say or it's too negative or it's depressing to talk about. Um, I think us as a healthcare system have a lot that we need to do to encourage conversation around how someone wants to die, um, to reward having conversation around it, to create the space for it. Um, and because it doesn't really exist, um, and when it does, it's through organizations like all of ours that are here and that have joined here that have such a passion for it, um, that most of the time in turn we see like a really poor quality of life care sort of being delivered at end of life, right? And there's a gap between the pa between patients who say they want to die at home and those who actually do, okay? So 71% of Americans would prefer to die at home, surrounded by friends and family. And in reality, 73% of people over the age of 65 are dying in hospitals, right? And so our company's founders saw this so clearly 
um, many years ago and shaped vital decisions as a solution for better endings, um, which I love. I actually like always love when I get to say that because I think that was such a such a um, very needed idea and, and way to just think about it, right? Which is like how to have better endings than what we're currently have been providing or are providing. Um, so vital decisions, we offer a suite of products and services that are all centered around advanced care planning, um, but are designed to sort of meet a continuum of needs. So I know you hear this so often in healthcare that it's about like the right intervention for the right person at the right time. Um, we at Vital Decisions take a population health approach to advanced care planning. So if you are 45 and healthy or 89 and facing an advanced illness, we have an offering that will fit, will fit your needs. I also think one of the biggest misconceptions about advanced care planning, and I know my friend Dr. Tracken is also um, so too familiar with this, but ACP is so much more than just an advanced directive, right? It is multifaceted, it is complex, it is individualized, and I think most important is that it's not easy. Um, and so what we know over our years of experience and having worked with hundreds of thousands of individuals and their families really doing comprehensive advanced care planning is that aside from just the power differential between physicians and patients, so I'm a patient and my doctor's there to save me and my doctor knows best and my doctor's going to tell me what's next, right? Even if you just remove, remove that dynamic, what we found is that much of what gets in the way of a patient playing an active role in sort of defining their care plan is behavioral in nature. And I think you touched on this earlier, um, Michael, but things like fear, right, anxiety, lack of self-efficacy, these behavioral barriers that prevent a patient from asking questions, from talking to their loved ones, from making decisions well in advance of a medical crisis. Um, and so to overcome those behavioral barriers and to really help patients kind of find their why, we utilize behavioral health specialists. Um, so these are master's level advanced degree clinicians. So they're counselors, social workers, marriage family therapists, but people who have a skill set um, and a background in behavior change and how to have value-based conversations. Um, so we offer three different advanced care planning programs that an individual can go through, and they're really geared towards and based on sort of where they are within their disease trajectory. Um, our flagship program is our Living Well program, and this is for someone who's currently facing an advanced illness and where end-of-life decision-making is very real for them with, with what they're going through. Um, so this is more like a specialized, comprehensive, um, advanced illness telehealth solution. So um, our programs are deployed over the phone and through video, and we work with patients to overcome the behavioral barriers that I just mentioned, emotional barriers, but also healthcare system barriers that prevent them from having the end of life experience that they want. Um, this program is done through a series of conversations where our specialists will unpack with patients their values, their preferences, um, their why. I think the most critical piece to all of this is for patients to really understand their why, their motivation for doing the hard work that is advanced care planning. Um, and then once those plans are created, they are uploaded into our online digital um, mobile friendly platform where um, the patients can download and share their care plan that they created. They can execute um, an advanced directive. They can share it with their healthcare proxy, their physician, the health system. Um, and then they can go in it over time and sort of update it. Another cool thing is that this online digital tool, which we call My Living Voice, and you can check it out at mylivingvoice.com, but um, this is also a standalone product. And this is free to anybody. Um, and the version that you would have access to is a version that would fit the needs of someone who's healthy. So you think about someone who maybe just got married and they want to document their husband as their healthcare proxy, um, or maybe you have a friend or a loved one who's just gone through like a really bad end of life experience. And so now you have some ideas of what you want or what you wouldn't want. You can go in and you can, you can document that, 
right? So those of for those of you who are relatively healthy but want to do some form of advanced care planning, then you can utilize our My Living Voice platform, and it would meet that need. Um, this is a plan and a platform that we envision would sort of follow someone throughout their life, right? So as you age and as things progress, you can access your plan. Um, and then we have one other program, which is sort of like our middle advanced care planning program. And these are people who may be dealing with complex comorbidities, but are not in end of life, right? And so for those individuals, we have what's called guided living voice. So if I just like step, separate for one second, you have um, your healthy, your um, my living voice, basic level, advanced care plan, this online digital tool is used within our other two programs. Um, we have guided living voice. Um, think about think about like my mother-in-law um, and when she was alive and she was living with COPD and CHF and it became very normal for her. Going into the hospital for three to four days twice a year, coming out, recovering, being okay for a while became very routine until it was the last time that she went into the hospital. Um, and so for someone like that, you know, a one session with a clinician to help you really understand advanced care planning and the need for it, and that you can make decisions and you can define the way that you want to live while, while you're dying um, is really important. And then they also have access to the, a more comprehensive My Living Voice. Um, and then the one that I talked about earlier, which is just our Living Well program. Um, so those are the three programs that we offer. It's a little bit about how we deliver those services. Um, we do have predictive models that help us to identify the right person for the right intervention. Um, and if I just sort of now step back and think about like, what have we found by doing this for so many years and by working with so many people? Um, and I think it's exactly what you would expect, right? We see a higher quality of life experience for those who are dying. We see that when someone's values are driving the care that they receive, that they tend to put more of a value on quality of life experience, their quality of life at end of life, than extending or prolonging their life. So in turn, advanced care planning and when done well, really removes much of the like unwanted, unwarranted care that's typically being delivered. Um, it significantly increases the patient's quality of life experience and then the forgotten ones, right, your caregivers and your loved ones, it removes so much of the burden and the stress that's put on them when they have to make decisions in a medical crisis and they don't know what decisions to make. They don't know if the decisions that they made were the right ones. And a lot of people live with that for the rest of their lives. Um, so that's just a little bit about vital decisions. One final thing I would say, one cool thing about vital right now is that we did just get acquired and joins an organization called New Century Health. Um, the parent company is Evelyn Health, but the whole thought process behind that is to take an organization like ours, which is best in class patient engagement, um, and New Century, which is a specialty care management organization focused on oncology and cardiology. And so they really focus on the physician engagement and getting physicians engaged in the process. And so now to complete the circle and to bring those two worlds together and even broaden our opportunity to bridge the patient and provider relationship so that the care plans that we're creating with patients make it into the hands of the physicians and are executed on and is the care that they're receiving. Um, but I did just want to say thank you so much for having me. Like everyone yeah. here is fighting the good fight, doing their part. And we really appreciate it. Yeah, well, congratulations. Um, that's exciting. I didn't know that news. Um, so very, very excited. I have so many questions, but we're going to jump over to Death Wives, um, who have become superstars in the death positivity space. Um, you might have read about them in Forbes or Vice or just attended one of their incredible events. So I'm going to turn it over to Lauren and Aaron. Very different uh, world, but very, very related. <laughs> 
Very different and very related, Leah. I think we resonate with just about everything that you said and share all of those core values, um, mm -hmm. but just approach it in a slightly different way, right? Which is meeting people long before, long before they're in grief or long before there's contemplation over their own death and understanding that when we're trying to make those heavy decisions and we're compounded by grief or fear or loss, we're not in the space to learn new things. We're not in the space to talk about what best practices might look like, right? So we wanna dial it back and get people to have this conversation and kind of change this narrative on a larger scale before death becomes imminent. Um, and we understand that there's a real death aversion in Western culture, and, and that's because we don't have close proximity to it, right? So we're afraid of things that we don't know anything about. Since the Industrial Revolution, death has just been you know, rolled behind the curtain and outsourced to, to professionals, and there hasn't been a lot of family care involved. So as, you know, as a side effect of that, we're afraid. We're afraid of it. Uh, so Lauren and I came together, formerly her as a funeral director and myself as a death doula and a ceremonialist, and just wanted to teach people like really accessible and easy ways that they could start interfacing with the death of the people in their communities and in their lives. And we created a, a whole series of education. Some are just individual classes you can pop into for two or three hours and learn about, you know, the, the legalities around home funerals, for example. And then some are longer certification programs that people who really want to dig into the work uh, can do. So I'll let Lauren take it from there. <laughs> oh, I'm Lauren. I'm the co-founder with Aaron here. And like she said, my background is in being a funeral director. And I saw such a huge disconnect with families who I would see again and again, you know, their dad died a few months later, their mom died, and then another family member. And I could, I didn't know what was missing until I learned about home funerals and family led death care. And that's when I kind of had my aha moment of, okay, this, this is where the magic happens in grief is when the families are present, when the families are active in either the dying process or taking care of them after they've died. Um, so I kind of stepped back from the traditional role and really just focused on educating because people don't know that this is even a right. Because of that death aversion, they don't wanna ask these questions. They don't wanna ask if they can keep their mom at home for a few days. But the answer is always yes. There are certain states where there's laws that are more prohibitive where you do have to use a funeral home, um, but it's always an option. So I was like, how, how do I let every single person know? Um, so I started teaching workshops locally here in Colorado and that's, that's how I met Erin. And she had the same exact passion with her background being a death doula of everybody needs to know this. So we started teaching workshops on the education um, and it's not really new education. We always say this. This is what this is what our ancestors did. We've always walked with them on this path of dying and after death. So we're just kind of gently reminding you and giving you the the modern day tools of how to do that. Um, so like I said, we taught workshops live until COVID. And then we were trying to figure out, well, can we even do this online? This is such deep sacred work. And what we created in these vessels together in classes where we were in person, we didn't think we'd be able to do that, but we were very much surprised to see that people were still wanting this information. And now our audience was worldwide. People were seeing death every single day for the first time with COVID, not knowing what to do with their grief. Sometimes this is bringing up unprocessed grief of somebody who had died years ago, and now all of a sudden they're seeing death again and it's bringing up a whole new um, situation for them so we've had people reach out to us of I want to be there to care for my family member as they're dying or I want to do this as a profession and help my community or even people just wanting to know like what can I do legally what can't I do all the way up to planning their own funeral um, and really thinking and contemplating that like Leah said you know we are not infinite. <laughs> we don't go on forever. We're not immortal in any way. And so taking the time to really contemplate that um, so that, you know, I think it's a peace of mind for the person who's going through the process of writing their funeral, but also for family members when they're in this compound state of grief, like Aaron said, and they don't know what to do. It's already there. And a little bit of them is almost in it as well. You know, they're putting their own magic from beyond the grave <laughs> into their funeral. So yeah, we really were just trying to figure out how to make sure everybody had this information. And we started creating these 
classes together. Yeah, and the scope is rather large. So there's a class on death doula ship. There is a course on um, being a home funeral guide because like Lauren said, that's legal in most states. Embalming is never required by law. There's a lot of like wild west to the funeral industry that people aren't aware of. And so they just do what the funeral director tells them to and pay the money they tell them to and they don't ask any questions. So we kind of want to, you know, delineate those things and, and tell people like what this means. Um, then there's also some grief work that we do. We do a class on ceremonies and rituals. And then we also have a big emphasis on environmental care and returning our bodies to the earth and giving that back as a gift, um, kind of as our final offering and as a means of gratitude for everything that, you know, we have consumed throughout our entire life. We go about life as consumers, right? So the act of giving your body back to the earth and letting your body essentially consume you. And that's a topic that nobody wants to talk about is final disposition and what happens to the body after it's dead, but it is incredibly relevant. So not talking about it isn't doing anybody any favors. And there's been a lot of progress uh, in this regard in the death industry in the last couple of years. Um, you know, we all think of traditional burial where somebody is usually embalmed, put into a casket, entombed under the ground. There's not a lot of decomposition happening anytime soon in that situation, right? Or we're also familiar with fire cremation where they're put into the retort little brick oven and they go up in flames. Uh, and so those are still definitely the most common, but there are I guess three, you could kind of expand them into even more, but three main types of, of green or natural disposition that are available now and that are, they're all legal here in Colorado where we live and they're kind of legalizing across the country state by state right now. Um, but those are water cremation where you're essentially replacing the element of fire with the element of water and dissolving the body. It's 95% warm water, 5% alkali. Depending on the power of the machine, it takes anywhere from about eight to 20 hours. And then the final um, you know, the product, the byproduct, it's a sacred byproduct, but by definition, the byproduct is uh, two things, a chamber of liquid where all of the soft tissues and the organs have uh, turned into a liquid and, and super nutrient dense. So we're giving that we're giving that liquid to farms and CSU is studying it. And there are some local farms here that are taking it. And you're really giving your body back to the earth in that way. And then the grievers in this case, if you know if their loved one chose water cremation, the process happened, this, this fluid was given to this farm, they could go back in the spring and they can visit this garden and watch you know, these peonies and these massive sunflowers raise up that were literally you know, fed by by their grandmother or whoever it was. Um, and then just, I know we've got a short time, so I'll briefly touch on the other two, but the other two are natural organic reduction, which is in layman's terms, human composting. And it really is exactly the same process. Um, we create a container that's primed for decomposition. So wood chips, alfalfa, and a little bit of oxygen and water flow. And then just like a compost bin, you're just you know turning that compost once a day. And in these we, we provide our own heat, as everybody knows, when you die, all those happy gut floras now start, you know, breaking down your body and the heat that they build up is actually the heat that helps with this decomposition process that you end up with a compost material. There's no DNA, there's no human remains at the end of this process, and that can be returned. And there's no power to source. So mm -hmm. it's totally green. You're your own power source. Yeah. <laughs> So um, and then the final one would that. just be natural burial, just natural burial, right? We don't need to preserve ourselves. We have this idea that we're different than nature and we have to preserve ourselves. Somehow we're special, we're, fa we're fancy. And so we want to preserve ourselves, you know, in these, in these boxes. But why? Why are we above nature? Aren't we a part of nature, really? I mean, aren't we kind of supposed to break back down and return to the earth? So the third way is is just that, you know, it's called natural burial and you're not yep. embalmed and you're wrapped in a shroud or put into a box that is made out of a wood that will decompose. So those are things people don't ever want to talk about, right? But just even casket choice, like a pine box that will decompose. And you can make that amazing. Everybody that you love can paint their hands and put their handprints on it. They can write poems on it. They can cover it with dried flowers. It doesn't have to be like the cheap version of, of doing this, right? And the alternative then are these caskets that are steel or they're made out of hard wood and they're lacquered and they have metal parts on it. And that's never gonna break down. We have to think about the water table. We have to think about that organic farm that's bordering you know, the cemetery and, and all of that embalming fluid that's leaking over True here. True story, we have one of those here, so. 
Um, And on top of what Aaron's saying, I just want to say, even though the natural organic reduction, the human composting and the water cremation seem new, they've been used forever. Water cremation is used in a lot of hospitals across America. Um, I believe Mayo Clinic is one of them. They've done it for over 20 years. And the, the natural organic reduction has been used in farming in America since the 1800s. It's the same exact process. So we know that it works. We know that it's environmentally you know, conducive. People just don't know about it. So that's what we're doing is you know, popping into this little screen in front of you and giving you every single option so that you can make the best decisions for yourself or your loved one if you're their caretaker. Yeah, so thank you, Michael. And I wanted to add that both Aaron and I were at the Dr. Gabor uh, Monte mm-hmm. last week and we just adore him. And we actually use some of his teachings in our classes. So yeah, this is really great. Yeah, and that was great to watch him. He's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so what you're experiencing right now is, is um, neuroplasticity. Um, as a listener, your brain is going from advanced care planning all the way to giving your body back to the earth. Um, and that, that incredible like rush in your head or maybe some resistance to it, you're actually building more neurons and more neuroplasticity. You're gonna live longer and happier. So you're welcome. Um, so Michael Fratkin is one of those names and human beings that you hear when you hear the word palliative care. He's one of the pioneers. Um, he shows up um, all of the time in all of the best places with the best smile and spirit and has done incredible work for so long. Uh, Michael, tell us what you have. You have big news, too, but I don't know what you want to talk to us about today, but I'll listen to whatever it is. Well, I'm going to tell some stories that were sort of stimulated by the conversation. It's a cool place to last because Leah's work is more sort of population based and uh, proactive, like getting people to understand that navigating the healthcare system is in their hands if only they will hold on to the steering wheel, right? So that's mm-hmm. like kind of early. Yeah. And then Lauren and Aaron are like telling us all this mind blowing stuff about what happens after and how you can empower people before to manage their after. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, and palliative care sits somewhere in between those two things. And what Aaron had said about um, how the care of human beings as they finish their life is relegated to a healthcare system that's really not at all designed to take care of them. It's just like spot on. Um, so first I'll introduce myself and then I'll tell a couple of stories that I think highlight that. Um, my name is Michael, Michael Fratkin, Dr. Fratkin. I am a, I'm a father and a husband and a brother. And I got a lot of friends. Um, but I'm also what's called a palliative care doctor. And what palliative care doctors do is care for people, not patients, but people. And that distinction is the secret sauce. Um, In the middle of the crazy healthcare system that's burned me out at least three times in my career, what we add is this complementary and strangely uncomfortable or awkward within the healthcare environment, different perspective, but it's a simple, I mean, with this set of people that are listening to this presentation, um, it's like, duh, but in the institutional structures and the industrially designed healthcare system, the idea that these people we want to call patients with diseases and think of them as a set of problems are actually people. And we are this crazy modern manifestation of the realization of that, trying to put a stake in the ground and grow within the healthcare system to acknowledge that. Um, So palliative care takes care of people who are seriously ill, the people that love them. Uh, We do that with, guess what? Other people. Um, And those people are also called nurses and mothers and husbands and doctors and care coordinators and chaplains and all the rest of it. Um, But they bring those skills, that knowledge base, their orientation to the institutional structures 
um, as well as their humanity. And we create teams around individuals, <coughs> excuse me, that include all of those represented domains. Um, and we meet together on a level playing field with as little power, weirdness, and hierarchy as possible to look at people from 360 degrees, um, agree on what they designate as the most important stuff to them, and then we roll up our sleeves and get busy accomplishing that. Um, so that's palliative care. The two stories I want to tell relate to a couple of things you heard. Um, one is uh, that I, I looked this up and it turns out there's been about 109 billion human beings that have walked, crawled, stumbled, uh, jumped across this planet's surface since human beings have been more or less human beings and a little less um, homo something or else, <laughs> about 100,000 years, about 109 billion of us. Um, and there's about seven and, a, and change billion of us left. So that means that 102 billion human beings have died. And if you look at our culture, number one, you might not think that we actually noticed that truth. And number two, the reason I do the work that I do and that I'm building capacity for palliative care is that I don't think it's ever been harder to die than it is today. I mean, the work that Aaron and Lauren are bringing into the 21st century is like Lauren said, ancient wisdom, ancient knowledge. And it's exactly what's been missing for a hundred years in the quote, modern medical world. Um, we try and make that a little bit better. We've got a little anchor in the healthcare system because I have a license and I am certified to bill insurance and I have a revenue stream that allows me to build this crazy enterprise. Um, um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not fooled for a minute uh, that what we're doing is, is not fundamentally medical work. What we're doing is fundamentally human and community and family and spiritual work. So that's one story. The second story is um, related to, I think Lauren mentioned immortality and we're not, and there's some truth to that, but I wanna tell a story about my daughter. Uh, when she was about seven, we were reading this book called uh, Lifetimes. And this book uh, talked about all the different animals and how they lived all their different periods of time. And uh, like mayflies are 20 minutes or a day or whatever. And butterflies are 30 minutes or 30 days. And Galapagos tortoises live for 273 years or whatever. But it's this great book with beautiful language and it made an impact on her. But fast forward to, I don't know how long afterwards. And we were looking at images of the monarch butterfly migration. Um, and we were talking, I was talking about how they fly from like Central America to Minnesota, to San Luis Obispo every year, and then they fly back. And I, you know, six months up, six months back. And my very brilliant daughter said, Dad, how in the world could that be possible when they only live 30 days? It's like for a second, I was like, wait a minute. And then of course I realized that it's actually not a butterfly flapping their wings from Costa Rica to Santa Barbara and back um, and sending postcards home. It's six generations of butterfly that fly up and six generations that fly back. So there's a little bit of immortality because in a little bit of Wikipedia searching, they've been doing that for 240 million years. Not exactly or technically immortal, but Butterfly has been doing this for nearly ever, right? And if you were to like stop a butterfly somewhere in Baja and chat with them and ask them how important they thought they were, how significant they were i'm certain they, well i'm very significant i've got to have babies and eat milkweed and fly around with my friends i mean i'm 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 the bomb right um and that's true too 
and it's not the whole story. So that's my second story. And with the time left, which I do, I have any. I was just going to say, I'm a technology. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, go for it. We, we started a little late. Okay, three minutes. I'll give it three minutes. Because <laughs> I wanted to say that you know, this is end of life tech for healthcare. And I have to tell you, I usually avoid talking about technology because I'm much more interested in talking about butterflies and human beings. Um, that's just my preference. <laughs> um, but the technology that we use and we've been using from the beginning is video conferencing. I noticed this was in my pocket at the beginning of this thing and we started doing it and I realized, oh my God, this actually works and nobody's doing it. And um, in our prep session, we talked a little bit about why I think it works um, and I'll just plant the seed. Um, by having a conversation that occurs, like an actual conversation, this is more of a webinar for the moment until we ask questions and go back and forth. But for the moment, I mean, this, this frame is actually an environment. It's an ecosystem for human connection, for exchange of information, um, for actually the exchange of some incredibly nuanced energy as well. And if I'm having an impact on you because I'm so funny or whatever, realize that we could, we're having a very framed conversation. Now, I, in the pandemic, I've tried to have really fun encounters with my friends and my family, and it's not so good. I really need the social primate pheromone touching kind of thing to manage it. My, my family just talks over each other. It's very stressful and awkward and Zoom doesn't work for my family or my friends. Um, but for a framed encounter that defines the boundary between I and thou, this has incredible advantages and is better than real life for this work. It's not everything. I can't listen to their heart or poke their belly or do the couple of things that I occasionally want to do, but for globally and in interesting ways, and you can ask me questions about that later, um, it really is better than real life. Okay, here comes the hook. <laughs> now we all just want to talk about butterflies. <laughs> Great story. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Sylvia. Sylvia, I know has questions for each of you. So uh, I will start with Michael so we can keep in the same mood. So back home, I used to go to the homes of our patients, of my patients, to see them at home. And even the seeing the environment talked a lot about the human being, the person, right? So I find the same way that technology today is a way to connect better to their reality because I can, I can see where they are sitting, what is behind them. Uh, it's a way to connect in another level. So it's a way to, as you said, um, use the technology in the advantage when it's, it's, it's better, right? Uh, in the ICU, I've been giving information about our uh, patients uh, to their families that were not able to come, right? And they were at home and then connecting the patient with the, uh, with the family members with uh, iPad, right? Uh, in the middle of the pandemic, we, do, we did it a lot. And it was a way to bring uh, the person to them, right? The, the loved one to them. Uh, so I totally agree with you. And I know that you have been doing this in places where palliative care is not available uh, because you cannot have a palliative care doctor for a very few population, like in a very small town. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, first I'll just say there's some interesting things about walking into a person's home. Um, for us, it's always this sort of smorgasbord of information and very valuable when we knock on the door and we walk in. Um, but imagine that what we also are doing is bringing a power differential into the space um, that we don't do when we meet them in this consensual environment. They show me what they want to show me. I can ask them to show me other stuff if they want to, but they don't have to deal with the doctor coming in 
and looking at their house, which they may be too sick to keep up the way that they want, or they may be embarrassed about their Rottweiler, or they may have a schizophrenic brother in the back room who's screaming, whatever it is, there's a lot of power dynamic when the doctor or the nurse or the social worker knocks on your door and walks into your space, right? So I'm doing home visits, but I'm doing home visits that are much more leveled and, um, and whatever information I get, I ask them, I, t I have them show me how do they hold, how do they store their medicines or they, I have them show me what's in their refrigerator sometimes because I kind of find that that's a little bit of a tea leave evaluation. I can kind of feel what's going on in their life if they have you know one flat bottle of coca-cola and a fuzzy science experiment that tells me a little bit about their food security um so there's that um we are working um at the moment all over the state of california 58 counties most of our folks or half of our folks live in places where they don't have access to even hospice care when they need it so we end up caring for them with our palliative care team and they are it's very remote in the northern part of the state and there are otherwise even in populated areas that are palliative care deserts where there's really limited or no palliative care uh, system available to them and so we use these technologies we've got a i think about a hundred ipads data enabled ipads that are in circulation um, that we send to people um, and we asked for them to send them back and we've had to put some parental controls on some of those. Um, but but we have we, we connect them as needed to their healthcare team um, uh, and can do that pretty much anywhere. Um, that, that's Mike, wonderful. Well, I, I just one more thing. Michael alluded to the good news that I share with Leah. We also were acquired by a digital health company not too many months ago, which has been an extraordinary adventure. Um, they do advanced care planning and digital health technology stuff that I really don't understand. And they realized that that wasn't the whole story. So in the same way that Leah's combined forces with a, a, a capital bearing um, larger organization, uh, we've combined forces with a capital bearing, not larger, but kind of equivalent size, but complementary, so that our platform includes super duper technology and the people to make that technology really deliver the results. So that's Vinca. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much. We had them here with us before. Um, so Erina Lauren, I love your presentation. And my question to you is, have you had clinicians in your workshops? I think we clinicians are taught to keep the patient alive. And we actually don't know what to do when the patient dies. Sometimes even a, one fellow, I al always tell the story as a surgeon, he said, they told them to go and, and declare the patient dead. And then he went and he don't know what to do. He asked for dead, everything he said, the patient is dead and said, I declare the patient dead. And he did like this because he didn't know what to do. <laughs> so yes, this is a true story. So. <laughs> I'm wondering if you have clinicians in your workshop or perhaps you can uh, make some workshop for clinicians in the future. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. We would absolutely love to do that. Um, Aaron and I have talked about that over and over again. We were both CNAs at one point too in our lives and okay. volunteered in hospice. So we have this kind of understanding. My grandpa is a cardiologist and is one of those anti-deathers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the biggest failure in his life is if somebody dies. So when he, when we talk about the work I do, he's just like, I can, I can respect it. I understand that there's a place for it, but he also is like, that's not where I want to go. So we would gladly, gladly welcome physicians. And we have had some nurses. Yeah. Um, we've got a doctor in our death school right now. We've had, a, we've had a few come that's, through. Okay. Yeah. That's death school's a little thing. bit different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, when I was doing my hospice training, when I was first getting started at this, I remember being surprised when, you know, we were kind of going around introducing ourselves and this older man introduced himself as a retired physician. Um, and, and that's really what he said is just what you alluded to. He said, you know, my whole career death, I ha if, if one of my patients died, I failed, I had a bad day. I carried that home with me. I didn't know how to make peace with it. You know, I was running away from that my whole career. And, and so I'm, I'm here in this space to try to make peace with it. And, yeah, thank you I so much. If, 
Yeah, of course. Thank you. What you do, I, I think is amazing. Uh, we have to learn more about it. And then, Leah, I have tons of questions for you. <laughs> uh, I'm embarking in this advanced care planning program for my for the enterprise I work in the Cleveland Clinic. So I know that it's a huge work. My first question to you is how do you integrate your documentation uh, into the healthcare system for physicians to get that information right away? Uh, if you, there's any, any uh, way to um, integrate these documents uh, of the plan of the patient, more than the advanced directive, more the advanced care planning of the patient into EPIC yeah. or any electronic record. Mm, yeah, so we are in conversations with EPIC, Cerner, Collective Medical Systems. We will also reach out to an AD Vault or a Vinca who has that access and that capability and love to partner and sort of um, help the plans get through to the EMRs and through the health system. So one of the things that you'll hear me just as I talk and the relationships that I build, it's really about like what you're an expert in and what you spend your time in. And there are other organizations that have really spent a lot of time in being able to develop that connectivity that we would engage and partner with, right? To make sure that whatever health plans we're working with. So one of the questions in the chat I just wanted to answer was, yes, we partner with health plans and our services are offered free to the patients. Um, so there's no charge for our service. And then just to go one step further, we also make our online digital tool free to anybody, regardless of what health system you're a part of. Um, but yeah, so we'll work to make sure that we can get the plans that are created um, into the hands of the physicians as best as possible. That, that's perfect. Oh yeah, just to clarify real quickly. So if I'm in a health plan that um, is working with vital decisions, then the full suite is covered. Um, but if I'm not, can I access your full suite um, out of pocket? Um, and I know that there is, to clarify, there is the free tool, um, My Living Voice, available to anyone. Um, and it's a beautiful tool. So that question is, can I play, did I get that right? Yeah, so currently today, um, we only offer our services through a health plan that we're partnered with. And the health plan can choose what service they want to offer. So um, I would say that the health plans tend to, uh, and the majority of our, of our partners utilize our Living Well program more for those who are um, facing an advanced illness. And within that program, of course, is our online digital tool. And then free is our online digital tool. And then that middle program is something that we actually just brought that to market about a year and a half ago. And so we're bringing that to our to our health plan partners and to enter the marketplace still. So my question now is, have you had any uh, backlash or any resistance from physicians getting the, their patients that they take care of the patient for 20 years and they may have had some informal um, discussions about mm -hmm. advanced care planning and something is in their notes. And then now somebody from another place is talking about this with their patients when, when you are a physician, primary physician, you have a relationship with a patient for years, how, how that is mm -hmm. working. Yeah, so I would say that we have not received any backlash in the sense of getting any negative feedback. We yeah. have struggled to engage physicians into the work that we do, right? And so that's why this partnership with New Century Health who has a relationship with the physicians is what we see as like, closing the piece because we have it with the patient. Over 70% of the time, we're working with a loved one, a caregiver, a surrogate, like someone else in that patient's family. We're also working with them. And so what our specialists do is keep the conversation very much to the patient and the family and empower them to have the conversations with their physician, right? So we'll even help them create, what are the questions that you want to ask your physician? Okay, write them down. Put them in your put them in your pocketbook, right? And then when are you meeting with them? Okay, let's talk next time about how did that go. We stay we we, we really try to stay very out of the physician patient relationship because that is the strongest relationship and what there's so much trust there. So we, we kind of come around it in a very soft, gentle way. But the physician should be getting a more educated and empowered 
um, patient that's now coming to them with questions that they may not have opened up the conversation, but they now have that, that way to move in and say, oh, you know what, this, let me talk to you about palliative care. Let me, let me talk to you about hospice because they open it up for them, if that makes sense. <laughs> I love what you're saying. Many patients, and I had a patient who had uh, cancer, three uh, recurrences, and, and she was dying. And, and the family member told me she didn't want to ask the physician to stop chemo because she didn't want to disappoint him. So sometimes patients want yeah. to stop uh, curative therapies, but they are not empowered to do that. And physicians, on the other hand, they say, she didn't say that, so probably she wants to keep doing this. So uh, yeah. somebody yeah. outside helping them to think about options and empower them to think about it and then go to the physician, I think it's a, an, an amazing work. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you. Can I say one more quick thing on that, if that's okay? Yeah. Okay. So that dynamic you also see with the patient and their family so the patient is suffering but yeah. she doesn't want to tell her daughters that she wants to stop chemo because they're going to yeah. think that she's giving up and then giving the up. daughters right they don't want to say mom you like stop or you know you're sick this is yeah. not what you want because now we're getting so there's so many things that happen when people are not having conversations and assumptions that are made and we're just looking to open a safe place for that dialogue so that it, it can take place. Beautiful. All right, so I've got one last question. It's a million dollar question. It is for Lauren and Aaron, and you have two minutes to answer it. Sorry, it's so juicy. Um, so you see people before they die, and, and then you see the families after they die um, in the work that you do um, and have done. When somebody it has faced their mortality, um, isn't as terrified of it, or is a little bit more comfortable with it. What are you seeing that's different um, mm -hmm. in the dying? And, and you just like whatever part, there's too much to answer here um, and um, go. And then we'll be, we'll be done because we're gonna hit time. <laughs> I have two quick things. I'll try to only take one of the minutes, Lauren. Um, the first is that just naturally, like as these five senses that we are inputting information from start to diminish and kind of go offline, there's this whole other sixth thing, this whole other spiritual thing that opens up. And so a lot of time, not all the time, like, you know, how much medication somebody's on can affect it. A lot of things can affect it. But a lot of times we'll see the person just kind of naturally or and organically have this spiritual shift and begin to mm -hmm. see their grandma who's already died, see their child who's already died. You know, there's there's a lot of spirituality in the space. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say about it was I forgot. Lauren, what was the other thing? <laughs> I was going to say that um, I see life. So just like when you're in labor and they say, you know, just relax, open up, be the lotus. It's kind of the same thing at end of life care. So when they've accepted and they're part of that process, when there's peace around them, then they are kind of present in that space, right? That Aaron is talking about. They're part of this life force one last time, but they're also open and accepted and breathing and processing and laboring into their death in a different way. Ideally, they're seeing it as the next right thing, right? Because we tend to be like stopping death from coming, but it is the completion of it. It is the next right thing when it is time for mm -hmm. it to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said. Sorry, I went up just because we were at time and I know we could talk about that for a whole other hour slash 10 years. Um, you are, what an amazing one hour so packed with such extraordinary wisdom and solutions and thoughtfulness. Um, thank you for being here. Um, thank you everybody who took the time. Uh, Sylvia, um, your, your partnership means everything to me. Thank you once again. Um, and for those of you who want to come to another wild session today, I'm going to share this and I'll, I just put it in chat. We have a day. Um, with Keeper and Talk Death. And the person that's presenting is the forensic pathologist um, who, who works with NCIS and Law and Order and, um, but is also an acting, um, leading um, forensic pathologist. So 
very different, very related, very wild. Um, maybe it suits you, maybe it doesn't. But um, with that, um, we'll see you next month. Um, and we'll tell you soon who's coming to chat next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.